Hello again. Welcome to Neonatal Clinical Series. Today we are going to discuss a very important yet debatable topic in neonates, which is neonatal hypertension guidelines in neonates. This topic is very debatable worldwide since we don't have enough studies to build an evidence-based guideline, however, if you are still using dopamine and dobutamine as the first line of treatment you need to watch this video, as there's a theory that states that we should stop using conventional hypertension guidelines. Watch this video if you want to get practical discussion of this theory. In order to make it practical and fun we are going to discuss the use of inotropes and chronotropes on a real case study, but first, if you want to become more familiar with neonatal shock, I would recommend watching my shock video before we proceed with our case discussion. So we have a 7-day-old preterm baby, who was admitted for PDA treatment, and now he developed NEC and sepsis. Then he developed neonatal shock manifested as persistent hypertension, not responding to dopamine 20 micrograms, and a low dose of epinephrine, metabolic acidosis, and anuria. What shall we do now the baby is not in shock, and not responding to dopamine, dobutamine. To answer this question, we need to know the hypertension guidelines approach. The first approach, which is the number approach, which is to use dopamine and dobutamine immediately. Or the second approach, which is the pathophysiology approach. To know the cause and treat it instead of checking only numbers. In order to determine the approach we should take, it's important to review some key facts. Hypertension is a late sign of shock and it occurs only when the body cannot compensate for the shock. Therefore, when treating hypertension, it's important to remember that we need to improve perfusion, not just focus on blood pressure numbers. So, as agreed, we will use a pathophysiology approach. To treat shock, we need to identify the cause, which is usually one of the following. Vasodilatory shock. Cardiogenic shock. Ductal shock. Adrenal insufficiency. How can we differentiate between them? The easiest way to identify the cause of shock is by performing echo, and this is what we did. The study revealed adequate myocardial contractility, with a shortening fraction of 48%, normal 28% to 44%. In addition, both right ventricular output, RVO, and LVO were adequate, at 282 milliliters per kilogram per minute, and 287 milliliters per kilogram per minute, normal 150 to 300 ml a kilogram a minute, respectively. RF measure is affected by both pre, load and afterload and thus values below the normal range may indicate intrinsic myocardial dysfunction and or changes in the loading condition of the heart. Right ventricular output may first appear to the reader as a measurement of blood flow to the pulmonary circulation. However, it is also a measure of the blood flow returning to the right side of the heart from the rest of the body. Therefore in the absence of significant atrial level shunting, RVO also rep resents systemic blood flow. As previously stated, in the pres, ends of a left to right shunting at the PDA, LVO becomes a measure for both systemic and pulmonary blood flow. In patients with left to right shunting across the PDA assessment of right ventricular output, or SVC flow, is thought to be a better measure of systemic blood flow. However, both techniques have their significant technical and pathophysiology related limitations. For instance, significant. Left to right shunting through the foramen ovale renders RVO. A less appropriate measure of systemic flow. As for our case, cardiac contractility appears normal as. Suggested by the adequate fraction shortening. Output, both RVO and LVO, are also within normal range. Hence, we can deduce that the hypertension is not caused by. Myocardial dysfunction. Rather it is secondary to a significant decrease in the SVR calculated as MBP to CVP or LVO 50.04 mm Hg at ml a kilogram a minute, most likely due to a cytokine storm, induced vasodilatory shock in the setting of the gram-negative sepsis and without adequate compensatory increase of cardiac output. Furthermore, as LVO and RVO were virtually equal, 282 and 287 milliliters per kilogram per minute, respectively and the diameter of the ductus arteriosus was relatively small with bidirectional shunting suggestive of near-systemic pulmonary pressure, the PDA did not play a significant role in the development of the systemic hypertension. Now with the additional information confirming the clinical presentation of vasodilatory shock, 
let us discuss the management that best fits this infant's hemodynamic alterations. I highly recommend pausing the video and taking some time to consider your options before revealing the answer. To select the best option, it's important to understand the pharmacology of each drug. You can watch our videos to learn about the pharmacology of each drug. I highly recommend pausing the video and taking some time to consider your options before revealing the answer. To select the best option, it's important to understand the pharmacology of each drug. You can watch our videos to learn about the pharmacology of each drug. Our options are Continue Continue current treatment and monitor signs of shock, urine output, blood lactate. Start Start dibutamine infusion at 5 micrograms per kilogram per minute and titrate to achieve target MBP. Escalate Escalate the dose of dopamine infusion. Escalate Escalate the dose of epinephrine infusion. Replace. Replace dopamine with norepinephrine. Start. Start hydrocortisone with a 1 mg per kilogram, loading dose followed by 0.5 mg per kilogram every 12 hours. The first option was a huge failure, so it is not logical to continue with the same regimen. The second option is to use dibutamine, which is a common choice in most NICUs. However, after considering the pathophysiology of our shock, and understanding the pharmacology of dobutamine, it is clear that this is not the best option. Since we are facing vasodilatory shock, high doses of dobutamine, which mainly works on beta receptors, may cause vasodilation, something we absolutely do not want. What about increasing the dose of dopamine? Infusions greater than 20 micrograms per kilogram per minute are associated with an increased risk of dysrhythmias e.g. Tachycardia and bradycardia and vasoconstriction. Dopamine stimulates the release of endogenous norepinephrine, which may be low in preterm neonates. Dopamine at doses, 10 ug a kilogram, a minute causes increased PSV. Consider increasing the dose of epinephrine. This could be a good option, because the baby was on a low dose and we can still titrate to higher doses. Additionally, epinephrine is a very effective vasopressor that works on alpha receptors so it can play a role in the treatment of our shock. Using norepinephrine would have been more effective than dopamine from the beginning, as recent studies have shown it to have better efficacy, and the same level of safety as dopamine. Unlike dopamine, norepinephrine increases systemic vascular resistance while decreasing pulmonary vascular resistance. The serum cortisol level was appropriately elevated, and the patient's primary condition likely contributed to the development of gram-negative sepsis, and thus, septic shock. It would not be desirable to use hydrocortisone to improve the sensitivity of the cardiovascular system to catecholamines. However, if the patient's condition and hemodynamic status worsened despite the appropriate escalation of the dose of epinephrine, in addition to the use of norepinephrine or vasopressin, the administration of hydrocortisone might be considered. Thank you. If you liked the video, like and subscribe.